Hey there, it's Nat Ferrier. And I wanted to do a video this week on the fear of public speaking and how to turn our fear of public speaking into love of speaking. And I wanted to give you four tips on what we can do to help you do that as well. What got me thinking about this, you might ask? It was inspired by last week, I was sitting in on a presentation where a colleague showed us Kelly McGonigal's TED talk from about three years ago on how to make stress your friend. And in that she talks about the flip that she did professionally as a Western medical and psychology professional. She realized the significance of what happens when we talk about negative research that points to a negative result, a bit like pointing the bone, right? saying she realized that for a lot of her career she'd been saying well stress is harmful to you and can cause death but she picked up on some other research that says that said that it's the mindset around how we contextualize stress that's actually having a very great impact as well because she then found research that was suggesting that a lot of the people who genuinely sincerely believed that stress was harmful for them and potentially going to cause fatal stress-related illness, funnily enough, ended up actually dying of a stress-related illness. So she realized that she didn't want to be a part of that and she needed to start flipping the way that she was thinking about that. As I was watching that, I couldn't help thinking about public speaking, fear of public speaking is viewed in people's heads as being right up there as that with our fear of death, right? We view it as being very uncomfortable and very unpleasant. So it then got me to thinking and posing the question to everyone in my networks last week from an individual standpoint and in terms of the group think that we're telling ourselves in reinforcing that notion that public speaking is as scary as death is that really helping us to embrace and to move into the space of loving it dr nick morgan who's one of america's leading public speaking and communication theorists, public speaking experts, uh, would say that in terms of the 10%, 10% love it, the rest don't. So what can we do to help put you in the 90% instead? I was thinking about four things from my own personal experience and professional reflection, there's four things that I wanted to share with you today that I find can be helpful. These things applied, have applied for me in terms of professional speaking, but they've also applied in terms of my, one of the most significant examples I want to donate as a story to help kind of illustrate how we can flip our mindset around this actually related to my performing arts days and it related to when I was auditioning for my course that I eventually did get into at Deacon Rusden I auditioned for contemporary arts drama but as a part of that audition I had to do a dance audition but for me personally I was never dance trained my mum was a dancer as I grew up, I learned piano. I ended up pursuing performing arts. I ended up winning awards for performing arts, but I hadn't actually ever been professionally dance trained. So in this audition, I ended up in this particular part of the audition with this room full of these amazing goddess dancer women, right? Who were clearly professional dancers who were all, there was a page, picture panel of judges up the front of the room and all of us getting ready to be led through various parts of the audition. And so these girls are doing all these stretches and they're all trying to show off all their moves and they're pulling their legs up in the air and they're doing all kinds of fancy stuff. Yeah. And I was standing there looking around the room, trying to get a read on the room, feeling absolutely mortified, right? Thinking, oh my God, I am going to die. I am not a professional. How am I going to get through this? I want to run. I would rather die than be in this room right now. I would rather be anywhere else. At the same time, as part of me really wanted to get into this course, right? So I had this other dialogue kind of going on and maybe it was my mum, bless her soul. God rest her soul. Um, maybe it was her voice in 
my head as well, kind of going, you got to stay in, you got to stay in. But either way, ended up going through this audition. We were guided through these various parts where we had to pick up choreography live in the moment. And we had to, we had the judges at the room, we had someone at the front doing the choreography, then we were going forward in lines, progressively moving forward and we had to imitate it and do it. I had moments in that where I was, again, that stuff's going through my head. I had the other voice going on in my head going, lean in, stay in, you can do this. Well, part of me is like, I'm sucking, I'm so crap. I'm so crap, I messed that up, I stuffed this up. Oh my God, I should just leave now. But you know, it was like two versions of me in that moment, but like I was dominated by the unpleasantness of it, right? Because I was like, oh, this is so mortifying. I just wanna die. Fast forward a decade forward to 2012, 2013, right? I had my own practice and I was practice managing by then and I was just starting to get started after community service career after all of that and a bit of art therapy training. I turned the performing arts into the therapeutic and stayed there for a bit. And I've eventually rolled it all back into one <laughs> in a nice neat little, oh, now I can apply all that at once. But by 2012, 2013, I was in a place where I was surrounded by a bunch of really loving, arty, alternative types that I could go to beautiful dance classes that were, they gave more capacity for me to just spontaneously move rather than necessarily be structured um, choreography based classes like there was five rhythms classes and there were other things that some, there was combinations within that in them but by that point I was kind of sitting in a place where I was embracing it and I was loving it and I was enjoying it so much to the point where you know when I was in some events I would just kind of go into my little zone and I'd start doing my thing. Sometimes my eyes were closed sometimes they were open and then I just noticed at some point that people around the room uh, in public spaces where they were allowed to and it was okay and I didn't mind. Sometimes I'd find someone just taking a picture of how I was moving, right? Um, other times there would be just people who would just be sitting on the edge somewhere and they'd just kind of be like vicariously enjoying me, enjoying, enjoying themselves by watching me enjoying me. And it was so... Like I was just in the purity of the moment, like 10, a decade earlier, when I was at performing arts school, even when I was in my drama classes, like at the end of my first year, my lecturer came up to me at some point after seeing me in a comedy performance where I had to dance for a bit in part of it. And he was like, he pulled me aside then because he thought it was a footnote moment to kind of point out that why are you not doing dance? Did you pass the dance audition? What are you doing? Because you seem like you can move and you're great at it. So why are you not doing it? Right. And back then it was in this era where I was completely kind of dependent upon the external world before I could do what I love. I needed to pass an audition. I needed to, uh, somebody else needed to say yes. Somebody else needed to approve of me. Somebody needed to give me validation, especially that I was enough that I could do it. Uh, and that was part of what was kind of getting in my way, right? Was this whole kind of notion that I needed approval or validation and the locus of control was kind of external within that yeah which was different in 2012 2013 and is kind of different when I run my own events today because I'm not looking for anyone's approval now I'm just doing it for the love of it so in terms of the four things that I wanted to say to you around what is it that helps us flip out of that horrendous fear space and that fear language into being able to enjoy it more and love it more in the moment. Because it's one thing to get over the fear of initially getting up on stage and giving it a go, right? That's one phase. Then what I'm talking about also today is the phase where you're actually doing it and then you're experiencing the terror live in the moment. And it's very easy at that point to go, holy crap, I'm never going to come back because this is just too intense. There's too much adrenaline. It's too scary. Too much is growing on, going on. And then you end up not growing on from that because it's easy at that point to potentially just go, I'm going to check out here because that was too much. And that's where a lot of people who end up in the 90% are kind of sitting in terms of mindset around it. So in terms of the four things that I think are really important, 
that just were the top ones off my head today to help flip this for all of this, flip the fear into the love. So there's A, letting go of that external validation and need for approval, right? Being able to flip that, the locus of control into intention related to soul instead. So what do I mean by that when I say intention of soul? This is part of your soul purpose. It's doing what you love. It's your chance to be of service. It's one of those two things, right? So it's flipping it from somehow needing to achieve something external, remembering to focus on the soul aspect. Number two, there's a very deliberate choice in terms of passion, in terms of choosing to go towards the possibility of what you might love instead of running from what you fear, that's a choice. And only each one of us can make that choice that I'm going to open the door. Kind of like a little bit, I was talking in an interview with uh, one of my colleagues, Georgette May Medell. We were talking about this territory a little bit in the interview that we did uh, last week, right? In terms of it's a choice to choose the passion over choosing to run away. So there's a little bit of that, that it's a choice that each one of us has to make to open up the door to another possibility. Number three, you might have already interpreted it within what I said, right? But it's the rewriting the story and it's the flipping the self-talk. It's choosing to stop saying I suck and to start realizing where I'm actually great at this and to acknowledge those possibilities. So you start looking for a different version of that story. So that's what was different for me between that decade is by the time I was a decade later, I'd also seen myself and experienced myself doing it enough times that now people were inviting me to their dance events when they were facilitating to have me crew on the event because I had energy at that point that was like I'd get on the dance floor first and then everyone would follow and get up, right? So if you wanted to get an event started, it was like, oh, hi, Natalie, bring her in and she'll get the party started. So that's part of what part of me being able to have that energy was like the mindset in me that had flipped to I'm good at this and I love this. And so that's really important. And flipping away also from this is a scary, sucky experience. People are going to judge me. I might make a fool of myself. Any number of things that are going on in our heads in that moment. And there's deeper layers underneath that. I could do a whole video in itself just on what's really driving, a bit like Inception, the three layers deep of stuff that is the reason we're really scared of that space, right? But again, it's flipping this sucks into this is exciting. And then number four is about learning to actually ride the energy and channel it in ways that work for you, yeah? The adrenaline can be unpleasant if you contextualize it as unpleasant, but if we can learn to sit in that zone of, because what's the difference between like going on a roller coaster and loving it and being terrified of heights of, from being on the roller coaster, right? I mean, again, it's part of the intention that we're going into there on it. There can be a phobia underneath that for sure, but it's like part of us, it's then about the recontextualizing it and reprogramming, reprogramming ourselves to go with that energy, to not fight it, to not be trying to control it and repress it. It's part of the controlling it and repressing it. This is what makes it worse and makes it so unpleasant, I found in my experience. Certainly dealing with, because, you know, when I started professional speaking, I had a whole other level of anxiety come up with it because I was afraid of not being enough professionally. So I revisited this journey again for me to realize um, that it was a lot about how I contextualized it. And it was a lot about in all the days I had been on stage and I had been loving being in musicals and I'd been loving improvisation activities in performing arts classes and the kind of things where you could just get up and be creative and spontaneous and live in the moment. Again, why was I loving it? Because I'd learned to ride with that energy, channel it and find ways to move with it and use that energy to my advantage. So that was a big part of the difference as well as the fourth thing. So that's my four things that I wanted to mention. Now, I would love to hear if there has been any light bulb moments in this for you today, do feel free to share or comment below. Uh, if you think someone else might benefit from this, do please feel free, feel 
more than welcome to share this on for other people as well. And the other thing that I wanted to mention, I've also just put up at the moment, if you do happen to be struggling a little bit with the internal dance of this, I've just put up an outline for a course I'm running now called Own Your Voice, which is a very bespoke program in the way I've designed it. I've based it on 12 sort of modules of content around the things that we need to know as kind of the foundational prerequisite stuff that you need if you want to be a professional speaker or you want to do more professional speaking there's kind of some things that you have to know first and do first but the first and this program is designed to help address them in a depending on your level of experience of what you're doing and your aspirations and or the level of stuff that's coming up for you like there's a bit of flexibility within this to design it for people and your specific circumstances to help meet your needs within it right but the first up to four sessions of this are specifically around helping to bust through the mindset stuff and the fear and to help you better manage your energy on stage and be more present on stage be more confident resilient on stage so if that is something that you feel like if you feel like you could use some support to help step into that space then feel free to reach out as well in regards to that course and we can have a bit of a chat around that as well because that might be another medium by which I can help support you right now to move beyond that space of fear and into the space of loving speaking instead wouldn't that be lovely as I said please feel free also to share this on if you think it's relevant to someone that you know and yeah love to hear your thoughts love to hear feedback and this is Nat signing off for today. Hope you've got lots out of it. I hope you're having a great week and look forward to talking to you more soon. Cheers. Bye.